Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, afternoon, 11 o'clock is always that weird hour. Uh, we're going to give it one or two more minutes for folks to click in from their previous meeting, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for joining. All right. Good afternoon. Morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone so much for joining. For folks who don't know me, I'm Allison Kretzinger. I'm our Director of Public Affairs here at the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And part of my role is getting the honor to lead our legislative work uh, leading up to and during the legislative session. And then after, as we pivot towards implementation alongside my colleague, uh, Renee Newkirk, our Chief Financial Officer, who has joined us here in our uh, incredibly talented teams that do this work within and uh, with our agency. Um, uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Today, Renee and I are going to take the opportunity to share with folks just the sort of update and wrap up to the legislative session that just concluded 11-ish days ago, I think. Although I'm not our Chief Financial Officer, math is not my strong suit. Um, uh, so uh, we're excited to share these updates with you. Uh, appreciate the patience and giving us a bit of time to wrap our head around the final budgets, all the final bills that have passed. Um, and so happy to share what we learned, what we got, what we'll be doing uh, with you as we walk through the deck. And then we'll talk a little bit about the end about what to expect uh, with implementation and implementation timelines, as well as ramping up for the next legislative session, which that process is well underway inside the agency. Uh, so with that, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. For folks who have joined us before, this is really intended to be a simplified graphic of really complex processes that uh, have a lot of intersection between various roles between state agency land, in which DCYF is one of, uh, the government, the governor's office and the Office of Financial Management and the state legislature. We're now at that phase where the session has concluded, all the bills have passed, all the budgets have uh Passed, and now we're in that window where the governor is working to sign legislation um, and ultimately will sign the budget. He has about 30 days from the end of session to make decisions to take action on and sign bills. We anticipate uh, most bills to be signed, as often happens, and then the budget ultimately to be signed um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at in the process, as well as our agency is preparing for and beginning the implementation process of bills and provisos that passed and impact our work. And go ahead and go to the next slide. As we do in all of these, I think it's important to ground us in the realities that led us to and through this legislative process. Uh, this was a supplemental legislative session. In our session, our legislature comes to town every year. Uh, in our state, they come to town every year. The first year of the biennial budget, which was last year <laughs> and will be next year, or a biennial session is a longer session that sets the budget. That's really the moment for, for new priorities, bigger spending. They're really mapping out the next two years of work inside state government. 
supplemental years, what we experienced this year and experience in even number of years, are 60 days. They are a marathon at a sprint pace. This year was no exception to that rule. And they are intended to be tweaks, modifications, and updates to budgets and legislation that passed in the year prior or previous years. Uh, these are really not intended to be sessions where you contemplate new and big and bold and innovative ideas. They're really intended to be tweaks. And that is guidance that we get as a state agency from our authorizing environment, which is the governor's office and the Office of Financial Management as we hit head into any given legislative session. We really need to live into the values. I will say that this year felt more like a true supplemental than the previous supplemental sessions have felt. Um, I think as we were living in the realities of, of the pandemic and lots of federal one-time resource, there was more money to go around. And we really experienced last year and the, and the prior supplemental session in 2022 um, a really different feel an approach. It was also virtual, which was just a different feel and approach. Um, we were back in person this year. Um, so that was, I will say this session felt much more like a true supplemental. It was fast. It was furious. It was tight. Uh, it was, it was not, not sort of the, the, the innovation and lots of money flowing around. Um, I think also part of that is a reality of the, the economy, which Renee, Renee will talk about. I think the other reality is that as you all know, and we have said before, DCYF, every corner of every part of our agency continues to implement significant practice policy change and robust investment from uh, the pre-COVID uh, pre era, from the COVID era. And so there is a lot of work underway helping us live into our mission and our vision and our values and better support children, families, and those who care for them and provide services to them. Um, and that's a reality that governs us. We are a system of humans doing work by humans for humans. And anytime you make a tweak or a change to the law or a program, we have to change human behavior. Um, and there, there becomes a compounding effect when that change is consistent and constant and always happening. And so as we build our asks, and we built our asks last year, and we'll build our asks this year, we are really thinking about that. And that, that matters greatly uh, for our agency, and we take that into mind. And so that's just a reality. And with that, I'll turn it over to Renee to talk a little bit about the budget and economic realities. All right. Thank you, Allison. Good morning, everyone. The State Economic and Revenue Forecast Council projects an overall increase in revenue. The total state revenue is expected to increase by nearly $122 million in the current biennium. That's the 23-25 biennium, which represents a 3.5% increase in comparison to last biennium. Also projects a 215.4 million increase in state next biennium. That's the 25-27 biennium, which represents a 7% increase over the prior biennium. So although our overall state is projected to increase, it's important to note that it's also costing more to maintain current operations to fund entitlement programs, et cetera. So that leaves limited resources available for other program areas. So just wanted to note that. And with that said, in this 2024 supplemental budget, DCYF's overall appropriation increases by $421 million. That's a 9% increase over the current 23-25 enacted budget. So we fared mostly fairly well. Um, as Allison noted, Yes, as was as we saw in the governor's budget, as well as now the, the legislature's budget, this is a more traditional supplemental year in years past. We've had access to pandemic funding, stimulus funding. That funding has expired, um, so we no longer have access to that funding. So this truly is a more traditional supplemental budget, as we'll walk through. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison to, uh, to walk through some investments. Excellent. So the format today, I'll walk through many of the policy uh, bills that passed the legislature. Renee will walk through the investments and some of the provisos and funding that we received. At the end, we'll talk a little bit about investments in other agencies that impact us, our clients, those we serve, our providers. Um, and then we'll have time certainly for questions. I forgot housekeeping. Uh, there is a Q&A function in this webinar format. Please feel free to type your questions in there. Renee and I will respond to them as we go, sometimes verbally, uh, sometimes in writing. These slides, as well as this recording, will be posted to the Government Affairs website in the next week or so as we get that finalized and updated on the website. Um, but feel free to type your questions in and we'll respond to those uh, if we know the answer. If not, we may have to loop back. 
Uh, so I'm going to start with some of the pieces of legislation that passed in the uh, child welfare space globally. Um, I'm not going to go through all these bills in detail, and there are certainly other bills that pass that have minor impact to the agency or we have a role in. Um, this is not a, intended to be an exhaustive list of the of all bills. I think our our agency analyzed, uh, you know, four or five hundred bills and versions of bills this legislative session and produced gobbles and gobbles of fiscal notes. Um, so lots of work underway that we we had a hand in this year. A couple that I do want to highlight, I do want to note the extended foster care bill that passed 5908. This was a bill that was actually introduced last session and didn't quite make it all the way through the process. It was re-picked up this year and uh, makes some pretty significant changes to the uh, implementation of the extended foster care program. What this does is it means that Young people will uh, automatically be eligible for extended foster care, regardless of their participation in one of the federally outlined five criteria, um, and will have access to that that uh, maintenance payment or that resource as a young person. So there'll be some practice change here for DCYF as we implement this new approach and new reality where, where all young people who are engaged will have that resource, regardless of their participation in those activities. It also directs the department to build and make recommendations around an incentive program. So thinking about ways to incentivize young people who choose to participate in school or education um, as part of that process. So uh, no funding for that incentive program. I want to be really clear it was, it was included with this, but we will make some recommendations around that. Um, the other bill I think that's important to note is 6006, which is related to victims of human trafficking. So this is a, a bill that brings us closer to being in compliance with CAPTA or the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, the Federal Child Abuse and Prevention and Treatment Act, um, and uh, 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 helps reframe how we need to assess young people who may be victims of human trafficking that come to our attention and then uh, offer services to them. Um, additionally, and I'll talk in more detail on the next slide related to 6109, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll talk about this. So this bill was a response largely to the fentanyl crisis that we're seeing. Um, the uh, the bill was three-pronged. This slide highlights the services. There were two other components, and I'm really sorry. The UPS delivery driver who comes to my house every day is here, and my dogs are going crazy. So sorry if you can hear that. I'm a bit distracted by the noise. Um, the uh, 6109 was a really a three-pronged approach to the fentanyl crisis. The first being clarity in statute. DCYF Caseworkers across the state had seen inconsistent application in courtrooms around uh, rulings when judges were considering the potential harm and risks that exist when fentanyl is present in the home. And so the first part of this law is it requires the court to apply great weight to the lethality of highly, uh, highly potent synthetic opioids as dictated by guidance with public health um, uh, to the removal. Uh, so that's an update in law that will uh, give great weight to the lethality of this substance when judges are considering the removal of a child. Additionally, this bill uh, contemplates judicial training and uh, provides additional resource and support and guidance for judicial trainings, as that was another area that came up through this process is courtroom application, courtroom engagement, courtroom knowledge around the dependency process overall, as well as related to fentanyl. So we see that there. Um, and then the third part of this bill provided investment in a variety of services. I'll walk through the ones here that are relevant and under DCYF purview. There were also services in drug treatment programs, et cetera. Uh, we saw a, a couple of services, two pilots I'll talk about first, the public health nurse pilot and safety plan participant pilot. These were also investments made in the governor's budget. So if you, if you had joined us previously, these will be familiar. Um, Prior to the recession, when often when CPS investigators would go out, when calls came in around reports of abuse and neglect, there was a, a team approach, uh, sometimes in partnership with a public health nurse that would go out to support that family. And that multidisciplinary approach uh, landed differently and supported families in a different way. That work largely went away uh, during the during the recession of the early uh, of the late 2000s era. And so as we were as we were grappling with how do we respond to the increases in just the realities of of fentanyl being present, uh, this was an idea that came from the field to say it would be great to have this teamed approach of public health nurses to be able to go out with CPS investigators to support families. And so 
This is resource for a pilot. It will absolutely not be statewide. It is a small pilot in two communities uh, that, that the agency will, about two communities, the agency will work to stand up and learn from. These were one-time investments um, intended to be pilots. So we'll do a lot of learning over the next year um, and think about ongoing uh, asks potentially in these spaces. The other pilot is safety plan participants. One of the strategies that gets deployed in the, in the investigative phase or the front end of a case is, can a safety plan be put in place if there's risk or potential safety threats that exist that would support that child remaining in that home? And for some families, they have robust networks of natural supports and community aunties, grandmas, neighbors, folks who can be around that family and support the safety of that child while parents may be working to mitigate potential risks. Um, really, that's ideal. That's fantastic. Um, and some families don't have those natural or organic supports. And so this is really uh, the recognition of that to say, what if we had an option for families who we think a safety plan with additional adults and supports inside the home could be supportive, but they don't have that natural connection that can do that. What if we had the option to use third party or contracted safety plan participants to do that? And so again, not enough resource to go statewide. This is a small pilot, but we'll be stood up in a few geographies and locales to uh, support this concept of safety plan participants. Uh, two other models, home visiting contracted slots and child care contracted slots. This really is the concept often when we're engaging with a family in those early phases uh, and again, building safety plans, other community-based resources are identified as potential support. And some of those could be voluntary home visiting programs or child care. And I don't know if any of you have had children lately or infants especially and tried to find child care, um, but it means that you're calling a lot of places, really limited availability. You may be eligible for the child care subsidy, uh, many of the families we engage with are, but there still is an expectation that that family then needs to go find that child care. And so what this would do is create an automatic referral where we are able as an agency to, to contract with some child care providers and hold some slots open that then create an automatic referral. So when child care is identified as part of a safety plan and you have an infant, starts with infants, again, small geographically, but you have an infant, we can uh, say, hey, I think child care would really help mitigate some of the potential harm that could exist here. And here's the subsidy you're eligible for, so there's no or low cost to you. And here's a few child care providers in your area that we know have infant slots available because we've worked out this direct referral pathway. So it's a really exciting, new, innovative way to connect families with those services um, and, and support those providers uh, being there. The other, uh, and, and, and the similar model in, in home visiting, to be able to sort of contract to hold those slots open to create that direct referral pathway for families. Another service uh, that was funded in the in the 6109 legislation was a pilot for Intercept, which is an evidence-based uh, support model under the Youth Villages umbrella or YV umbrella. For folks who are familiar, familiar with YV LifeSet, that's a wraparound support for older adolescents. Uh, Intercept is a model that serves children and youth, the zero through 18, really supporting uh, prevention of removal or reunification in an intensive evidence-based sort of case management, uh, skill building way. And so uh, some resource here to build two pilot sites to learn about and add the intercept model to our combined in-home services array. And then I see a couple of questions I'll get to in a second. The last piece here is around legal liaison. So, and again, as we think about the three-prong approach to uh, the the bill, um, legal liaisons were added as a tool and a resource to have across the DCYF system to support caseworkers who are in and out of courtrooms or preparing legal arguments or understanding and navigating that legal process in partnership with our attorney generals, um, but to add additional sort of expertise and resource around the, the legal system for our frontline workers. Um, so a couple of questions that I'm going to run through that are specific to this in a previous slide. Um, what are the four locales being targeted for the home visiting program related to 6109? Great question. We don't know yet. The implementation scoping meetings for all of the work underway uh, and coming to us are, are happening and will be happening over the next couple of weeks. And we'll make some choices there. Um, I don't we don't know those yet. That will be an implementation uh, question. So, so stay tuned for some updates there. What is the evidence-based parenting support service model being used for the intercept? Um, it is intercept. And you can find more information by Googling Youth Villages Intercept on the evidence-based model there. That's the name of the model and the program that Youth Villages run that was funded uh, in, this, in this bill and budget.
Uh, do I understand correctly that DCYF considers it to be an appropriate safety plan for parents to use drugs while their child is in taxpayer funded care? I don't believe that's what I said. Um, we know that many families who interface with the child welfare system have a history of substance engagement, addiction, active addiction, previous addiction. And as parents are working to mitigate those, uh, child care can be a tool that is supportive and helpful, um, just like for, for parents that are working or for parents that are doing a variety of things. So I want to be really clear, that is not what I said. And we know our job and our first priority is to support families and children staying with their families. And if there are ways we can do that and provide resources to the family to mitigate elements or things that, that make uh, success and stability and safety uh, provide barriers to that, it is our obligation and our responsibility to invest in those and offer those to families. That is a core mission of this agency. Um, and, and as long as, pa as parents are working on mitigating those safety risks, we want to make sure they have the services that are available to support them. Um, So is childcare only provided for parents who are working or in treatment? There are there are still expectations of eligibility for childcare for families, uh, both income and approved activity. Uh, will EFC youth receive, oh, so then a question about extended foster care. Will EFC youth receive a higher monthly subsidy to the foster care maintenance payment, including EFC payments get increased? Great question. The bill itself, the extended foster care bill did not contemplate changes to the rates. There was a previous version of the bill that ultimately didn't make it all the way through that had some housing supplement and subsidy dollars in it. There was a version last year that tethered it to a different level. That did not happen. The extended foster care bill that passed did not contemplate changes to the rate. Um, Renee is going to talk about here in a minute some of the foster care maintenance payment increases and uh, when those go into effect. And so I'll let Renee talk there. So with that, I will turn it over to Renee to talk through some of the investments. All right, thank you, Allison. Um, so I'll review partnership prevention and service invest investments as well as child welfare investments. Uh, so the first is independent living. Independent living, this is a voluntary program that's designed to teach important life skills to current and former foster youth. There was two components to this funding. Uh, one is to sustain the independent living program. The program is funded through a federal Chafee grant, and that grant is allocated to states based on the relative share of children and youth that are in foster care. So as our foster care population decreases, our federal grant award also decreases accordingly. So this funding essentially backfills with state funds so that we can maintain and sustain the program. We also received funding for four additional staff, so I just wanted to provide some context to this. Um, the last biennial budget, the 21-23 budget, provided one-time funding for staff, and given that was one time, now we have funding that's ongoing for, for staff to support this program. Uh, the next is Rising Strong. Funding is provided to support the Rising Strong model in Spokane. This model provides family-centered drug treatment and housing programs for families experiencing substance use disorder. CSEC Receiving Centers, CSEC, that acronym is for Commercially Sexually Exploited Children. So this funding is provided to support two receiving, receiving centers that serve youth who are or at risk of being commercially sexually or exploited. Family Preservation Services, funding is provided effective in fiscal year 25 to support a rate increase to family prevention service providers. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Funding is provided regarding the DS settlement. So we receive funding in the 23-25 biennial budget to implement seven of the eight system improvements. So this funding is for the last uh, system improvement that, that we need the funding for, which is the family group planning improvement, which will improve family team decision-making and quality assurance in shared planning meetings to include revising our policies and practices. So this funding includes um, some staffing, staff for shared planning meeting facilitators, shared planning meeting program manager, a QA, CQI specialist, some program consultant supervisors, statewide mentoring and coaching. It also includes some additional one-time funding to expand the hub home model statewide, which is part of the settlement agreement and implementation plan. We also receive funding uh, to pay our legal fees and for stakeholder facilitation. 
also receive funding to support rate setting processes as uh, new placement settings are pursuant to the settlement agreement. So funding to support that. Emergent placement needs. Emergent placement services, this is a short-term placement that's provided when no other placement is available to children and youth with intensive support needs. EPS was established by the legislature in 2008. Since then, there has not been an increase, so it's it's outdated and um, a rate increase is very much needed. So this funding provides that rate increase. The current rate is $9,267 per bed, so this increases it to $13,413 per bed. So a good increase there. Um, so as Allison noted, there is a rate increase provided for basic foster care. It is not effective this biennium. It is effective in fiscal year 26, so next biennium. Uh, just for context setting, uh, so the foster care maintenance payment, this is to licensed caregivers. The rate covers food, clothing, shelter, personal incidentals. There was a $50 increase to address the cost of inflation that was provided in the 23-25 budget. So this is in addition on top of that. Um, this rate was based on a cost analysis. And I will say, given that uh, it's not effective until next biennium, uh, I would like us to work through um, and review further that uh, the cost analysis and if we need to make any tweaks or adjustments that we would follow up and request that in a future decision package. So um, I would like us to spend some time further reviewing that. The, uh, the CHERISH program, uh, so funding is provided to contract with an entity to provide educational and therapeutic services for children ages three to five who are in the child welfare system who experience developmental delays, disabilities, and behavioral needs. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison to walk through early learning bills. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, so we see we saw a few bills move in the early learning space this year. Um, certainly different levels of investment than we'd seen in previous years in early learning, largely due to the uh, federal one-time federal dollars we'd seen in the last couple of years, but still some meaningful steps and progress made here. The first bill I will highlight was actually DCYF agency request legislation, our only piece of agency request legislation this year related to the Early Supports for Infants and Toddlers program. I like to think about this as a, as a good little technical bill to align billing practices with service delivery realities. And it ultimately passed, meaning that ESIT service providers will be able to bill for the first month in which a service is provided rather than having to wait till the next month, recognizing that a lot of work happens in that first month and frankly, even before that first service is provided to do the assessment, the onboarding, the intake, the family coordination, et cetera. So thrilled to see this bill uh, passed and um, hopefully be signed by the governor here in the next week or so. Uh, next, I'll talk about three bills related to child care uh, eligibility, child care subsidy, ECAP eligibility. The first 2111 is largely just a is just a reorganization of the Working Connection statutes. Over the last number of years with the Fair Start for Kids Act and other bills, there was a variety of edits and changes in the RCWs related to childcare eligibility, co-payments, timelines. This was a cleanup bill that moved it all around, reorganized it in a way that, that um, allows flow and functionality. So no changes to eligibility or, or implementation with this bill, but a, but a reorganization of the RCW. The next two do contemplate eligibility, the first being 1945, which contemplates working connections, eligibility, and its uh, connection with food, with food benefits, or SNAP, if you will. So for families that are receiving food benefits, uh, it clarifies that that eligibility of that food benefit uh, verifies their income eligibility for working connections child care. It does not waive the, the requirement, it does not create categorical eligibility, and it does not waive the requirement that they must have an approved activity, but it certainly uh, allows that income to be verified through their SNAP eligibility. That's effective now for working connections and early ECAP, and then is uh, effective for ECAP as eligibility in 2030, so in a, in a number of years. 2124 makes a number of tweaks and changes to approved activities and expanded eligibility. Last year, there was a bill that passed that uh, clarified or, or made allowable child care providers under 85% SMI as eligible for Working Connections child care. This bill expands that to ECAP teachers, 
early ECAP teachers, Head Start, and early Head Start teachers. They were not included in that bill last year based on how the language was written, not by intention, but by uh, using the phrase licensed child care. Some ECAP and Head Start programs operate outside of licensed settings. And so this clarifies that, ensuring that all those teachers and, and staff are, uh, all those teachers are eligible. It also makes that uh, clear that if you are in a early Head Start or an early ECAP program, that does count as your approved activity for accessing the Working Connections Child Care. And this is really about continuity of care. Early ECAP and early Head Start are embedded in child care. So those families are accessing child care while getting the enhanced programming related to early ECAP and early Head Start. And so this clarifies and makes clear that that is their activity and those families uh, should be eligible providing they meet the income thresholds for those programs and, and maintain that child care subsidy for the duration of those programs. Uh, uh, Senate Bill 5774 is about fingerprint access. So background checks are a required part of many parts of the DCYF service, child care, and on the child welfare side for foster parents, group care, staff, uh, other family members or, or folks who may participate in supporting a young person who does have to come into out-of-home care. And so what this bill does is directs the department to stand up fingerprint capacity in some of our offices. It's pretty small scale to start. Uh, we, are in, we are excited about this investment, being able to roll out background checks across our offices. Um, and so look forward to uh, build, bringing on expanded capacity in a couple targeted areas to start. And then 2195, which I won't go into detail of, makes some minor modifications to the ELF grant or the Early Learning Facilities Program run through Department of Commerce that we are a partner in. So that's a summary of the pieces of the legislation that passed re regarding uh, Working Connections Child Care and or, uh, Early Learning generally. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Renee to talk about some of the investments. All right, thanks, Allison. So this si slide specifically covers uh, early learning rate adjustments. There was a non-standard hours rate. Uh, it's an increase from $135 to $150. Infant rate enhancement increases from $90 to $300. And the ECAP rate increase, which increases the school day slots by 5% and working day slots by 9%. These are all effective July 1st of 2024. So here in just a few months. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide to review um, some additional early learning investments. Uh, professional and development. So funding is provided to contract with an organization to help establish new childcare and early learning programs. Coordinated recruitment and enrollment. Funding is provided to support the consultation connections between transition to kindergarten programs and local early learning providers. Early child uh, mental health. Funding is provided to expand our infant and early child mental health consultation services, including funding to support rural schools and child care programs in rural communities. The Spokane focused workforce. Funding is provided to contract with an organization for a pilot program to increase the child care workforce and child care capacity in the greater Spokane area. Snohomish County Planning, funding is provided to identify and report on ways to strengthen the early learning community in Snohomish County. The Inclusion Mentorship Contract, funding is provided to expand the Inclusion Mentorship Program for increasing access to child care, which will provide providers with the necessary skills and knowledge to care for and educate children with disabilities, developmental delays, or challenging behaviors. Imagination Library, so some additional funding is provided for the Imagination Library. This program mails free books to children from birth until school age. So that sums up the early learning investments. Uh, so next I will cover some investments made in our juvenile rehabilitation program. The first is class action settlement administrative hearings. So funding was provided to implement a hearings unit to serve individuals under the age of 25 that are transferring to DOC, the Department of Corrections. Under RCW, individuals transferring to the Department of Corrections have a right to a hearing. So therefore, this funding supports us bringing us into compliance. Body scanners. The Department of Health implemented new rules related to radiation emissions. Therefore, funding is provided for us to purchase new scanners at the Green Hill School and Echo Glen so that we're in compliance with the new DOH rules. Gender responsive funding. Funding is provided for anti-bias training, youth stipends, and facilitation for girls within the continuum of the JR system. Echo Glen Security Services. So due to the changing and complex population, due to recent escapes, there's an immediate need to ensure staff safety, community safety, 
and the safety of youth and young adults at the facility. So funding is provided for enhanced security, such as the use of contracted security guards, as well as some other security measures at the Echo Glen Children's Center, while a perimeter fence is currently underway being constructed around the facility. Juvenile block grant funding increase. So funding is increased to implement community juvenile accountability programs in local communities. I also want to note, it's not on this slide, but there was a one-time reduction taken in fiscal year 25 of $5.8 million to the JR program. Um, although there was additional funding provided for the program, the reduction was taken on the basis that the program will underspend its appropriation in fiscal year 25. So also just wanted to note that one time. Okay, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So this slide covers our capital investments received for the juvenile rehabilitation program. So the previous slide was our operating budget. Now for a moment, I'm just gonna switch gears to discuss what was um, funded in the capital budget. So as noted, Echo Glen in the operating budget received some funding for Echo Glen security enhancements. We also received some funding in the capital budget. Um, while our perimeter fence is being constructed, we receive funding, additional funding to complete the perimeter fence to ensure that the entire campus has a continuous fence around all sides. So funding to complete that perimeter fence. We also receive funding to reconfigure and consolidate parking off campus to ensure uh, the campus is further secured. Um, we also receive funding for a secure control room serving as a single point of entry to the facility for staff and visitors. I want to note that um, there was $800,000 of funding that was provided next biennium, so it was assumed that not all of those three components of that project would be completed within the current biennium, so additional funding was provided next biennium of $800,000 to complete all three of those components for the security package. Green Hill School HVAC upgrades. So considering the living units and the support service buildings at the Green Hill School campus were built in the 1990s, they're 30 plus years old, they've reached their end of life, we've been having frequent system failures, so funding is provided to upgrade these systems. The Echo Glen Academic School walkway roofing and lighting. So the Echo Glen campus, it includes an academic school, consists of multiple classroom buildings that are joined together by this outdoor covered walkway system. The walkway system, it's over 25 years old. It's leaking, needs to be replaced just for the safety of those utilizing that walkway. So funding is provided to, to repair it. Okay, so that sums up the juvenile rehabilitation program. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide and I'll review program support investments. Um, we have a couple of technology investments that I'll review. So CWIS, this is our comprehensive child welfare information system. This is the case management system that supports the child welfare program. So funding was provided in the remainder of the this fiscal year and fiscal year 25 to procure and to begin implementing the system. We previously um, just completed a feasibility study. So now we have funding to, to begin the next stage of that, which is procurement and to begin implementing. So happy to see that investment. Um, SSPS replacement, funding is provided to complete a feasibility study. We're currently, a feasibility study is currently underway. We need some additional funding to complete it. Um, so that funding was provided. SSPS system, this is the system that it generates our invoices and payments to providers. It supports tax reporting, generates letters and notification documents to our payees as well as other functions. So it's in a very important system. It's old, antiquated, again, needs to be replaced. Um, so we have funding for, to complete that feasibility study. The staff safety and supports, I want to note that when we submitted our uh, decision packages, our budget submission last fall, about six months ago, this is Secretary Hunter's top priority request. It was supported and funded in the governor's budget, and we're seeing it now in uh, the legislature's budget. So really happy to see this um, investment. This funding uh, will provide supports for the entire agency, acknowledging the most need is for our child welfare social workers, for our JR staff that are working in community facilities and institutions. And again, with the change in our population where we're serving more children and youth with complex needs in need of mental health, behavioral health supports, the number of trauma incidents for our staff is increasing. 
So this funding will support our staff in managing not only the incident specific trauma, but also the day to day crisis that our staff experience. So this funding includes mental health contracts for our staff. It includes um, specialists to provide on-site supports for traumatic incidents when they occur and safety specialists to support the safety of our staff. So that sums up our program support investments. And I will turn it over to Allison to walk through investments that we're seeing in other agency that connects to the important work here at DCYF. Great, thanks so much, uh, Renee. There is a question before I move on to the other investments. Uh, 1.3 million to study upgrading the invoice system, not to actually upgrade it. Why does this cost so much? Yeah, that's just to complete the feasibility study. So there is a feasibility study that's that's underway. We've already made some payments for that feasibility study. So that funding really is just to complete the feasibility study. The feasibility study will tell us how much will it cost to re actually replace the system, um, as well as other considerations that will be known and that we'll need to know in order to build the system. Um, so that funding is just to complete the feasibility study. And I think globally, I'm not a tech expert, nor is Renee. I think globally, I think the, the sort of lesson learned here is that technology systems, especially in state, state government, are, are complicated, complex, multi-year, need to do multiple things. And technology projects globally, whether you're state government or or private business or industry, are are very expensive undertakings that, uh, that are in high demand. Tech fields are some of the most growing and lucrative fields. And so... Um, it does feel like there's a quite a bit of sticker shock when you think about that, but the reality is investments in technology to do them well, to do them right, to ensure they last is, uh, is, 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 is gravely expensive work, whether you're in state government or not. Um, and then a follow-up, I think, response around, a follow-up question, Renee, around the staff safety support. Can you tell us more about the crisis, crisis response volunteers? I don't remember that off the top of my head. Can you, I, I don't know if you can speak to that off the top of your head. Um, no, I think that's just more it's on site supports. Um, so this would be staff on site, more of like a, a peer to peer uh, support for those staff that have experienced trauma. But that's about all I can recall off the top of my head as well. Excellent. More to come as that uh, implementation planning rolls out. Uh, so Renee and I have summarized sort of all the things that are coming directly to the agency that we are charged with implementing. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the investments that are in other state agencies um, and other parts of the system that impact us or our clients, our families, our providers, et cetera. So we'll start in the early learning space on this slide, sort of as an overview of three pieces. Uh, the first is a study, a feasibility analysis directed at the Office of the Insurance Commissioner that is globally about essential workers and modifying definitions and programming for essential workers. And in that study, the insurance commissioner is asked to contemplate a variety of industry, but included in that list is child care workers. The next is the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges received some investment to support scholars uh, working on their childcare or uh, early learning credentials through the community college system. So we have scholarships that support providers accessing that education. And we know that for the early learning workforce, many of those scholars and those students are uh, later uh, non-traditional students, could be a second career, or may not uh, be proficient in English as their first language. And so this is some of that resource and support to wrap around the scholar, the learner, the students in those uh, in those uh, at the community college level to help navigate funding and accessing funding that exists. There's lots of funding streams that exist to help support college, but also access staying on track, uh, credit, credit uh, navigation, classroom navigation, et cetera. So some wraparound supports there. And then the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction did receive a little bit of resource to continue to support the ongoing coordination work as related to the transition to kindergarten program that passed last year. Go ahead and go to the next slide. These are some of the investments at the Department of Commerce related to early learning. Um, the Early Learning Facilities Fund did receive a pretty substantial investment in the biennial budget, so the last legislative session, 23, and not surprising, uh, the demand for application and funds outpaced the available resource. And so there was additional investments made in the Early Learning Facilities Fund, the competitive grants really about growing capacity, growing slots, as well as the minor renovations grant. So Commerce will administer those, but there is some resource there. In addition, Commerce received funding for a um, for a contract to implement and pilot a program for childcare 
in non-standard hours near or around or on a construction site, uh, sure GCYF will engage in that process and learn from that as we think about non-traditional hours and non-traditional jobs where childcare is needed. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, some investments in our child welfare and our prevention space that impact other agencies. So last year, House Bill 1186 passed, which contemplated a uh, response, a state response to prenatal substance exposure. This is run through the health care authority. This is simply some increased funding to implement pieces of that legislation, training, support, ongoing work related to uh, prenatal substance exposure. And then two investments at the Office of Public Defense that su certainly support clients that we have an intersection with. The first is their Shelter Care Early Engagement Program or SKEEP program, uh, where OPD social service uh, workers will be in, uh, added at the time of shelter care, really to support the, the parent there in navigating that court and judicial system and be an additional resource to the attorney. And then OPD also received a, a pot of funds for concrete goods resources for parents that they're serving. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, really exciting. Uh, this is uh, some proviso language and investment in, in largely the DSHS budget through DDA, but in partnership with DCYF uh, that really, I think, and I'm really optimistic about that sort of fills a gap in the continuum of care for adolescents in our state with complex needs. So folks are aware of and not immune to the reality that young people experience long stays in hospitals or being boarded in hospitals when there aren't services, programs, or residential settings that can meet their needs. Additionally, we see youth in our system that have placement exceptions when we can't, we don't have residential settings or placements that meet their needs. And so um, DSHS was able to secure a lease on a facility that was designed and built for young people uh, with complex needs that is not currently serving young people. And uh, was we were able to secure operating dollars in the, in, the, in the final budget to stand up a new service type for young people, youth 13 to 18 with co-occurring complex needs. So this is sort of underlying DD, IDD or autism, and then having sort of that layered behavioral health component. Um, this is small to start. We're doing this in partnership with DSHS, ultimately who's running it and the healthcare authority. Small to start, we'll learn, we'll grow, but really is trying to fill this missing gap of residential settings for young people to help stabilize, build skills, and then transition to a community setting, least restrictive option, or back to their family, really trying to avoid um, hospital boarding stays, out-of-state placement, or exceptional placements when they're under the care and custody of DCYF. Go ahead and go to the next slide, our last slide here. Uh, so JR uh, audit, this was a bill that then turned into a proviso that directs the JLARC or the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee to sort of do a deep dive into juvenile rehabilitation. Uh, what's working? Where are the gaps, both from a technology and infrastructure, a safety, a security, a programming? There's been a lot of policy change in the JR space, the juvenile sentencing space, JR to 25, implementation of the uh, elimination of solitary confinement, et cetera. And so this is directing JLARC to do some work uh, to look at the, the JR space and make recommendations for uh, improvements and changes there. I think that is our last content slide. I will, uh, Renee and I'll hang on. Uh, we got a few minutes here. If you have questions, type them in the chat. I will say that the uh, implementation timeline for things, just so folks are aware, um, the legislature just concluded, the governor is working hard to review and sign all bills in the final budget ultimately, and we are deep in the throes of implementation. So our process is some internal scoping meetings, making sure the multiple parts of DCYF that may have interface in a bill or funding, budget proviso or funding reality are connected, understand the charge and the requirements, and then programs will begin building implementation plans. Some of those are underway, some of those have been built, and some of those are forthcoming. Um, for, for elements that engage providers or stakeholders, um, stay tuned. M more to come. We need a minute to breathe and get our uh, get our, and our head wrapped around everything. A couple of questions coming in. Where can we find a detailed DCYF current budget? You are more than welcome to go to the LEAP website and read the budget bill. That outlines, um, you can, my favorite trick is to do control F, Department of Children, Youth, and Families. That will take you to our budget sections. There are four sections in that budget, early learning, child welfare, uh, JR, and program support. That outlines the total appropriation for our budget, as well as all them the provisos, existing and new. So I invite you to look there. That's the most detailed space around the DCYF budget. And then uh, what will any evaluations be done of the various child welfare pilot programs? Home visiting, intercept, third-party safety plan. Great question. That's part of the implementation conversation to understand sort of the evaluation there and the outcome. Given these are all sort of one-time funding and have one-year funding, it's going to be 
hard to do. Typically, evaluations have more longitudinal work, but that is certainly part of the implementation conversation to say, what do we hope to learn in a year? What are we looking for uh, that can inform and, and help inform either continuation or not of some of these strategies? So great question. Um, yes, there'll be some component of engagement and looking at evaluation and outcomes. To follow up on the EFC monthly subsidy, yes, there will be an increase, but not until uh, 2025, July 1, 2025, at the time that will move from 860 to 1034 a month. Um, I'd have to go back and confirm the numbers, but I will note when things are funded in out years, um, they're there, but we will likely still have to submit a maintenance level request for that funding, and it will need to be funded in the next biennial budget. So the way the legislative budget works is the two-year budget is the two-year budget, and that's in red ink, if you will. And then what's funded in the out year is really in the outlook, but that's not codified. That's not codified. That's not, there's no money directed to that yet. And so the legislature next year will have to reconfirm those investments when they do the biennial budget. So you may see a DP from the department at maintenance level that does request those funds to make sure it's accurate, it is inclusive of the EFC population, and has the accurate um, uh, uh, rates in it. As Renee indicated, there may be some looking at those rates again, given that the, the rate study was done a couple of years ago. So thank you all for joining. Well, Renee and I'll hang on for a few more minutes to see if there's any questions that pop in and um, appreciate everyone's time and energy and engagement today. Is it possible? So another question, is it possible the basic foster care rate gets funded for the next biennium will be higher than what was currently funded? Is that right? Um, so the current rates are, are what the current rates are. Uh, there's three different levels of rate based on age. Um, what gets funded in the next biennium will, will be up to the legislature. They, uh, in this budget and in this direction, said our intention is to fund in the next biennium the rate increase at the rate increase in which we asked for, which I don't know off of the top of my head. Um, it is possible that DCYF, upon review, could submit a decision package to make an adjustment to that, to increase that. It is also possible that advocates could advocate for higher rates than what the legislature intended and they take action uh, in a different way. So um, lots of possibilities there. Yes, it is possible it is it, it could be higher. I think is the short answer to that question. All right. Well, not seeing any questions come in for those that are hanging on. Thanks so much for joining and uh, feel free to reach out if other questions come up. Hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon.